I'm going to welcome him to the podium right now, Mr. George Elder. When Carl asked me to present, um, the immediate irony of uh, our animal association struck me. You are a club dedicated to the elephant, and I am dedicated to the goat. Um, the goat in most cultures, as well as many religions, is associated with the devil, derided and thought little of. Um, while animals like the elephant or the horse are associated with nobility, um, I have chosen to make my life with the goat. Um, and I'm not sure what that says about me, honestly. But um, as I have gotten to know the animal, I have become more and more conscious of how subtle the animal world is, even in its smaller members like the goat. And I think that a huge part of our responsibility as stewards or as keepers of this earth is to consider the subtle things and to understand them. Um, a couple fun parts about the goat you may or may not know. One, she is in the dairy world um, more efficient than a cow. She may be smaller, but per unit of production, she will outperform a cow any day of the week. And for a person who grew up in the manufacturing sector of Wichita, that's impressive. That's really neat that there is an animal that biologically outcompetes for efficiency of feed through uh, the animal that we associate with our dairy. Um, I chose to lecture or give a presentation today that uh, maybe is not exactly what you're uh, always talking about in a political group, um, but I think it has deep political implications. Um, a part of it will touch directly on some of those. But I chose to title my talk, The Aesthetics of Ambition. Um, at the outset, these two concepts, economic pragmatism or aesthetic ambition, are what I want you to understand as the uh, contrasting ideas that are going to come out in different ways in every part of my lecture. Economic pragmatism is a sort of acknowledgement of the world as it is and a surrender to the world as it is without trying to change it. Where aesthetic ambition is a vigorous and romantic uh, way of looking at the world that says there are ideals that are worth striving for. The world is not always as it should be and therefore changing the world might be our greatest call as we use the tools of business, of finance, of regulation, of political uh, power to do things in this world. So I want you to just have that in your mind. And then I'm going to give you a quote. Uh, I'm big on the romantic poets. I mentioned I was an English major. Um, in 1880, I'm sorry, in 1800, William Wordsworth said, the greatest peril to mankind is a failure of imagination. If we cannot look past the world as it is and see the world as it could be, we are indeed condemned to a pitiable state. I believe it is the chief noble faculty of mankind that we are able to see the world as it is and then imagine the world better than it is and work toward that better. I think that is our purpose, our call, our work in this world. Agriculture is a compound of two words, agri, which is field, and cultus, which is to cultivate or to change through labor. Um, I want you to think about this in regard to architecture, which is another word about making things or to change things through labor. Okay. Um, Single factor, single factor creation of value um, is illustrated kind of uh, simply in the Russian buildings of the 1960s. They created a lot of units of livable housing. Um, if we reduce accomplishment to a single factor like housing units or calories, 
um, we can really quickly slide into that sort of a ambition where we just create something simple. Um, in multifactorial creation or cultivation, we start to think about bringing in complex ideas like beauty, like desirability, like longevity. And as we do so, we move from just creating units that can be stacked up to creating value that is complex and durable and outlives its simple working life. John Ruskin was a, an English architectural and art critic, and he said that architecture is fulfilled, fulfills its potential in part by displaying a nuanced balance of control of material and aesthetic sensibility, which is capable of producing mental peace and joy and serenity. This can be achieved, Ruskin said, only if the building or the cultivation of the materials, the change of the materials is undertaken with the idea of balance, a complex multifactorial ambition of creating value um, that is not according to just the stacking up of units. At Eldersley, our mission statement is, in a essence, to harmonize the ecological and the aesthetic in an outcome of producing food. We believe that the ecological and the aesthetic um, are both critical to agriculture um, and that agriculture has both the value of creating units of food or calories, but it also has the opportunity of creating beauty and aesthetic and ecological outcomes that are multifactorial. A few topics uh, that we're going to touch on. Customer value. Um, critical to any business is how its customers perceive the value that a business creates. Um, two is regulation. And three is technology. We're actually going to spend the longest of my talk on customers um, because it's actually the most difficult part of small farm agriculture that's multifactorial in the current climate. And regulation and technology are both uh, actually, in my life experience in this business, smaller parts of what I work at, um, but provide some very interesting encounters and concepts. Value for customers. This is a graph uh, done by a man named Fred Provenza. Fred Provenza was at the University of New Mexico and did his research on ruminant nutrition. Um, some fascinating studies, but um, this is a simple way to think about the density of nutrition as it's created in animal products, applying both to flesh and dairy products. Animals that are moved toward simple grain uh, feeding and confinement, or confined animal operation feeding, um, actually produce products, both in flesh and the milk they produce, that are simpler. The acid profiles and the density of nutrients is simpler and less rich than that produced by animals that are in more natural settings, like grazing. Um, this is championed by numerous um, groups in the US and by a lot of groups in Europe. Um, Europe has a more advanced tiering of value than we do when we think about the tiers of value um, in animal products. We have kind of organic or non-organic, um, but the subtlety of it is really illustrated well by a continuum where on the continuum you have all shades of value or nutrition uh, created based on the practices in play. Um, the, line, the alignment here that we're going to talk about as we go on is actually that uh, some of the ecological outcomes um, based on how the animals are raised follow a similar continuum to this nutritional profile where as you change 
different pieces of the animal production scheme, you will also change ecological outcomes along with them and change the nutritional profile of the products produced. This is a, an interesting graph on food quality from the Raw Milk Institute. Um, Kansas is a place where raw milk is illegal, except sold on the farm, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, later. But in places like California and 10 other states, uh, you can go to Sprouts or a, a Whole Foods equivalents um, or other supermarkets and buy raw milk. And that is because there's so much focus on nutrition right now. Um, and what you get in this uh, is just a simple picture of the fact that a product as simple as raw milk or the kind of simple step of not pasteurizing milk um, creates a very different experience for the uh, digestive tract in our body. We have um, thought about food from a caloric standpoint, but bioavailability is now a very dynamic field where we're talking about the microbiome and how nutrients interact with the complexity of our digestive system. And this gives you just a, a simple kind of look at all the things that change as we pasteurize or as we heat a product like milk. Um, and some of those things are um, really undesirable, but in order to avoid them, you have to create different processing mechanisms and different value perceptions from consumers. Um, one of the things that is interesting is that data is uh, firm, the, the gains are not huge, but data is firm that things like raw milk or raw dairy products do have increased or uh, give better outcomes for things like asthma, allergies, um, and the whole list here um, that are things that most of us in our families have struggled with to some level or other. And so bioavailability in food is actually a big deal as far as optimizing our food system and the health of the food that we consume. Ecological resilience. You have four pictures here, and I'm going to give you a, an idea of why I put these up. Um, bees. A lot of people talk about the decline of honeybees. That's not actually correct. Honeybees are not declining, but honeybees are becoming a more fragile culture that requires more intervention by beekeepers than ever before. We have in 30 years decreased the working life of a queen bee by 60%, or we've taken it from six to seven years to two years. And the reason for that is not clearly understood, which is uh, really fascinating, um, but I use it as an indicator because it is talked about a lot in entomology right now in that we have created a more fragile culture for a really important insect uh, that we interact with. Um, lactating dairy cattle, so high intensity dairy uh, shortens the working life to 3.5 lactations on average compared to grass-based dairy, which is what I'm going to advocate for over and over through this discussion. Uh, grass-based dairy doubles that working life. The animal is able in that different production uh, scheme to double its working life. So you're moving toward a more resilient system uh, that acknowledges the natural order of the animal itself. Um, cheese. We'll talk a little bit about cheese, but less than you might think, uh, given that I'm a cheese maker. Um, camembert and brie cheeses. They're pictured there in a drawing from the 1800s. That's how they would have looked uh, prior to 1873. They would have had blue, orange tinges, yellow, gray tinges, all blended. When we think of those cheeses, we think of white. That's because in 1873, a strain of penicillium was isolated, and that penicillium strain is the bright white strain that we think of. And 
That strain has been cultivated asexually since 1873 by cheesemakers and culture providers, but it is now finally in crisis because there have been enough mutations that are competitive to that strain that have accumulated in French uh, dairy plants and in culture manufacturing plants that in our lifetime, we could see the disappearance of the bright white rinded cheese. It's a very serious discussion in France right now, and it's likely soon to move to the US and other countries that have used that strain to produce the white rinded cheese that we think of. Um, and the return is not a return to an absence of good flavor or texture. The return is just to a less aesthetically perfect food product that has multiple strains of mold growing on its surface. So it shouldn't be really scary, but it is interesting as an indicator of how we think about food culture that we are so dedicated to a single strain of mold because aesthetically we want food to look a certain way. Last over there on the side is uh, the Kernza plant. The Kernza plant is a wheat variety uh, that is perennial. Um, that, as a Kansa, I think we should all be very proud of. That work is coming out of the Land Institute in Salina. And while that work is still in its infancy, they have a long, long ways to go. I just want you to remember the difference. The Kernza is a rooting plant that goes past 20 feet where our annual wheat and annual grain crops typically root to about 16 inches at most, and a lot of them at 8 to 12. And from a standpoint of food resiliency, perennials are a huge and important shift that should be considered, talked about, moved toward in any way that we can, in my opinion, in the food system, because they allow us to weather periods of drought and difficult weather in a way that annuals simply do not. And they also allow for more positive ecological outcomes with less soil disturbance from tillage or chemical applications. And so perennials, just as a simple categorical move, perennials are a positive way for agriculture to produce the food that we need in the future. Animal welfare. Um, if you think about dairy, you just closed your eyes and thought, what does dairy look like? I would bet that your ideal, unless you've visited a lot of dairy farms in your life, uh, I bet your ideal would involve grass or pasture. Uh, most of us, it would. Um, if you don't believe me, um, I would say go look at the dairy section at Dillon's or at any supermarket, and what you'll see are, for the most part, pictures of grass and small farm red barns. Um, the interesting part of that is that very, very little dairy is produced by animals that are on grass, uh, less and less every year, and very few small farm red barns exist anything like those pictures anymore. Um, grazing, uh, just pictorially, you've got a couple images there. Um, those are just two images from the goat world, from my life. I've traveled a lot, looked at different goat farms, um, been to farms from 6,000 head of milking uh, animals to farms with 30. Um, we are a tiny, tiny little farm with 50 to 60 milking does. Um, we are at the very bottom scale of commercial farms. Um, I have seen great grazing operations with uh, anywhere from 30 animals to 200 animals. Typically, grazing becomes impossible with goats when you get up to four or 500 animals. Um, there are some grazing cow dairies that run 12, 1300 animals, um, but there are no mega dairies like the cow mega dairies with 25,000 or 80,000 animals that graze. Those are confinement dairies. Um, I want to give you a quote. Um, I believe it's really critical as we continue to go through turbulent political and uh, national times to weigh the practical against the poetic. Um, I think that we have an obligation both to consider the practical needs of our uh, leaders and of our laws, um, but also to consider poetic ideals and wisdom. Um, the uh, Hebrew spies were referenced at the beginning of this. Um, you're talking about a book 
referencing wisdom. Wisdom is a critical uh, piece of our culture. And I would argue that it is derived from many sources that we need to be very careful to give voice to. In 1888, uh, I'm sorry, in 1880, Fyodor Dostoevsky said, love the animals. God has given them the rudiments, the rudiments of thought and joy untroubled. Do not trouble or harass them. Do not deprive them of their happiness. Do not work against God's intent with these creatures. If you've ever seen a group of animals at turnout in the spring when they've spent their winter in the barn and they go out for the first time in March, it is a moment where animals are happy. They are joyous. And I think it's a moment worth preserving in animal agriculture unless we are very desperate. And to describe us as desperate in an agricultural sense, I think is very difficult we are wasting 35% of our food, and we are burning 40% of our corn crop as ethanol. Only 60% of those calories are consumed in the ethanol process, and 30%, 35, 40% are returned to beef production. But we are using a lot of calories produced for waste and ethanol, and there is a huge opportunity in food to turn our ideal towards something more noble. Vibrant food culture. Um, this is still part of what I think uh, is of value that farms have an obligation to produce for consumers. Picture of the old man there is James Harriet. Most of you probably have read his books to your children or read them, grew up reading them. Behind him is a patchwork of fields. You see the sheep grazing there. The, these, this patchwork of fields is the uh, system of agriculture in the dales of northern England. Harriet wrote about this work because he was inspired, he was delighted by the agricultural system that he lived in the midst of. He was overwhelmingly joyous after his life in that system and he couldn't help but write delightful stories that we still read to our children and I would ask is our agricultural system delighting children and people in it to the sense or to the degree that they feel inspired to write for children, that they feel inspired to bring forth the beautiful and poetic stories that they have encountered in that system? The second man is younger. He's James Rebanks. If you haven't read his work, uh, I'd encourage you to look him up. He wrote The Shepherd's uh, Life and English Pastoral. He is current, he's our generation, and he's writing about the same region where most of those small farms have disappeared, but there are still people practicing the same form of sheep rearing that Harriet described as kind of the dominant agriculture in that area. And Rebanks is an Oxford-educated, uh, UNESCO-employed uh, cultural writer and cultural preservationalist. He spent time with UNESCO preserving world heritage sites around the world and then returned to his native northern England and he dedicated his life to chronicling the beauty of that way of life and sharing it with the world in a hope that part of it, some small corner of that way of agriculture could be preserved. And he is doing that work now, really fantastic erudite, um, voice for a way of producing food that is beautiful to behold. One story I don't want to miss about Rebanks um, that I think is really critical is he tells a story about his grandfather teaching him to shovel manure. And his grandfather teaches him an English word, an old English word, and I couldn't find it. I sifted through his book and I couldn't find where he he wrote it, but it's an English word in Old English that means to shovel manure with purpose and with dignity. And those of you who grew up on farms or around farms might not have thought of it that way. Um, but what his grandfather was getting at with his grandson is that there is a dignity and joy in the human body exerting itself to a purpose that can be very simple 
but very beautiful. And as much as uh, we have diverted a lot of that energy to athletics and to gymnasiums, uh, which is great, um, I think there is also joy to be had in systems that require manual labor and give dignity to it. Um, these are pictures from our Get Your Goat program. This is a program where we send home young goats to people's homes all over the city in the spring. We're doing it tonight. Uh, we'll send out about 35 goats to people's homes and they will take them, uh, snuggle them, kiss them, sleep with them in their beds, watch the football game. And what it was for us is for me a moment uh, in the spring is the, the spring is the most active time, but also the darkest time in the dairy. Uh, it's a time of uh, when you have mortalities at a higher point than any other time in the dairy. I have work morning and night and sometimes in the middle of the night. And what this program was, was a way to share the joy of animal agriculture with our community. And I think that that's a very important piece of what small farms have to offer in any community is to share and provide a permeability to agriculture so that the communities that surround them can interact with the cycles, which are very natural and very beautiful cycles of seasonality. Okay, um, I mentioned Dostoevsky's quote about not frustrating the animals and about preserving their joy. I just want to play this for you and I want you to watch these goats. Okay, let me go back to... So, in a peer-reviewed study done by the, reviewed by the NIH, um, dairy cows who grazed were found to have higher levels of serotonin and lower levels of cortisol. So you can argue from it, from scientific or from whimsical, poetic ways, um, but animals are happier when they graze. They are happier when they have purpose, when they are allowed their natural form of life. Um, and we as humans, as stewards, get to make that choice by the animal products we consume, by the dairy and meat products we consume, whether we allow that or whether we deny that to them. And Dostoevsky is a prescient voice speaking in 1880. Um, there's a modern voice I'll tell you about later. Um, but I just wanted to give you a picture of what it is. That activity is only allowed to about 2% of the 400,000 goats that are milked in the United States. About 2% of them are ever allowed outside of concrete facilities where they are raised birth to death in confinement. And I think that matters. Um, and I'm an odd voice, I'm a goat farmer and a small farmer, um, but you'll find goat farmers and small farmers are very acerbic people willing to give their opinion. Um, honesty. Um, if I showed you these three pictures and told you these were the marketing pictures. These are three of the last four posts that a major goat cheese manufacturer in the US um, has made on their social media. Uh, if I showed you these three pictures and said, how do you think their goats live? What do you think you'd say? 
It looks like they're great. This is called inference marketing. An inference can be used without legal ramifications to infer something that you assume, but they didn't actually say. What you assume, because these are the images that dominate their social media and website and public portfolio, is that their goats are happy. Their goats are allowed to graze. Their goats are outside having a beautiful life. These are the facilities where they live. Now, these facilities are not dirty, dark places. They're well run. The animals are, are, hap are, the animals are well taken, cared for, um, taken care of. But why would they market it that way? As a small farmer, it makes me very angry that that sort of dishonesty is practiced in the largest grocery stores across this city and across the nation and is allowed because in my opinion those pictures are the birthright the value that small farms still create and it is all we have to vend or to sell in the modern food community and it is stolen through inference marketing by large companies owned by either european capital groups or the largest dairy manufacturers in the u.s like land of lakes to sell confinement produced milk and cheese products produced in facilities like this. Greenwashing. Um, this is a quote by Ruskin again, 1880. It is the glistening, softly spoken lie, the amiable fallacy that cast that black mystery over humanity. The most profitable practice or the most economically pragmatic one in the current market is uh, very clear. It's used by restaurants all over Wichita. It's used by the largest store chains in the US that are in Wichita and beyond. It's called greenwashing. It's an official marketing strategy taught at universities. And what greenwashing does is use phrases like featuring local ingredients or use pictures of local farms on the front of their stores, while a very tiny proportion of the actual ingredients in those dishes or of the produce in those stores is actually from any place local. Um, having dealt with some of the large retailers, there's actually different terms given to local vendors. So we can get the most visible spot, but we get lousy terms as far as the logistics that are offered. And so we get priority of visibility and we get second class pricing and tiered structures for our delivery of product. Um, this marketing strategy is common, effective, and it is destructive of the food culture it purports to serve. It is an amiable lie. It is a deception which seems innocent, but it is insidious in the greatest degree. Regulatory bodies, and I will try to finish this up here. So this is a on-farm procedure that I'm asked to, to do about three times a week to prove that there are no antibiotics in my milk. Um, have no problem proving that. I think it's a great thing that farms are asked to certify that their milk is not laden with antibiotics in the dairy industry. That's actually very important. But um, I just want you to see this. Um, in a small farm like ours, this represents uh, that we have to take about three to $4,000 a year and dedicate it to this procedure. And we control the procedure, so it's done on our farm. It's not supervised in any way. There's no actual accountability for the process, but we have to go through the process and create reams of paper that show that we have gone through the process. But nobody is actually there with us to certify that we did it honestly. We could screen for antibiotics by sending milk that we've never tested to a third party lab who the Department of Agriculture has ties to and controls and gets data from, and so they would have more access to it. We could do that for $300 a year, OK? 
compared to the three to four thousand dollars a year we have to spend to maintain an on-farm lab. When I talked to the secretary of the dairy about this, um, there were some acrimonious emails, kind of a long chain of them. Um, we finally got to the bottom of it and he said the science supports what you want to do, but that's not what the law says. You'll have to go personally and you will have to communicate with the national committee of milk shippers and try to get the law changed. As a dairy with 50 goats, trying to get a national law changed at NCIMS without the support of the bureaucratic mechanisms of the state is like asking for us to, it, it's not feasible. It is something we may achieve in time to come, but it was an extremely frustrating um, reality to find out that we are spending three to four thousand dollars a year where we could spend three hundred and we could for three hundred get it tested by a lab that holds us actually accountable because we don't control it and the department could have better accountability and records than we can give them because we're not professional lab techs the test is really finicky and it's a pain in the butt nobody likes it on the farm um, but we can't because the laws were created for large business and for small business, it's just deal with it. Raw milk. Um, I just want you to note here what's allowed by the law. That 750 um, colony forming units per milliliter. That's what's allowed by the laws on the books. People producing raw milk in scientific states like California, where they're doing it under scrutiny, are pursuing five colony forming, or I'm sorry, 10 colony forming units, and they're achieving an average of 2.3. That's because they want to crank out clean product and serve their customers well. In places where that's allowed and it's scientifically governed and monitored, it's totally possible to create super clean milk and super clean dairy products as long as it's incentivized by access to the market. Technology. Large scale versus scale neutral. In 1950, we had 3.5 million dairy farms. Today, we have under 20,000. Not all of that's bad. There's parts of that that are great. Most of the dairy technology that has come out has been for large scale, like these rotary milking parlors. These parlors are deployed in 21 hour shifts. So they're seven hours on, one hour for cleaning, seven hours on, one hour for cleaning, seven hours on, one hour for cleaning. Very efficient manufacturing technology. They're deployed almost exclusively in confinement dairies, so large scale dairies. Um, and a lot of the focus of dairy technology has been on creating efficient systems that allow the scale to grow as large as possible. Small farms don't need less technology, we just need different. Anybody ever had Jason Wiebe's Cottonwood Cheddar Reserve Cheese? Okay, that's being produced by one of the most sophisticated milking technologies on earth. And that technology is scale neutral. It's a milking robot that milks the animals with no human operator, and it's suited for 60 cows. The most imperiled dairies are the dairies from 50 to 200 cows in the current climate. Technologies like the milking robot by De Laval are potentially game changer technologies because they represent an advancement that's scale neutral. As human beings, the tools we deploy are not limited. The tools we deploy as technology advances are guided by what we want, what our ideal is for the world we want to build. And I think that scale neutral technologies for dairy are just a, a really exciting thing. They don't make one for goods. <laughs> data technologies. Um, data technologies in the dairy industry are bound up in some really old traditions. Um, 
We used to use a program that was only accessible from PC, cost us uh, $6 per animal per month to gather basic data. We now use Google Sheets. We have way better data collection, and it costs us about 75 cents per animal per month. And that's only the beginning. Um, what we've done, and I'm not a technologist, but what we've done by integrating Google Sheets into our dairy data is actually just created networks of usable data to make managerial decisions that are more effective and they don't care what scale you're at. It's free technology and it's easy to access and organize and as that's done, managerial decisions become easier and easier for small and large operators. Marketing technologies. Um, this one is probably the biggest one that we lack. Um, if I had to say, where does small farms face doom? It's that we don't have the marketing technology or the ties to consumers that we need. Um, the percent of retail value where the retailer is capturing about 45%, the distributor 15%, that leaves the farmer with about 40%. That's about what the cheese world is. I don't know what it is in other commodities. Um, what we need is a system where we reduce the inefficiency of delivery to the consumer. That may sound selfish. It partly is. I'm self-interested. I'm a farmer. There you have it. Um, but I think it's possible. And what happens when you shortchange the farmer to that 40% is confinement dairy or lower quality of product produced in order to produce according to the available pricing that they have access to. And I think that we could call higher quality of product up as we make more efficient the marketing technologies deployed and streamline that process. And uh, in humble, simple, silly ways, um, Small farms work at that through a model right now called the CSA, a community supported agricultural model. And it's not all that needs to be done. There's so much more that needs to be done, but it is one of the simple models that farms are using to try to reduce the distance from production to consumption and make the process more efficient to capture share of the value. These two graphs are just uh, things that have happened in our world. This is the cost of data storage. Um, things that we want become reality over time. We can reduce costs as human beings dramatically over time. This is a graph of inflation adjusted food cost for our basic commodities. We can reduce costs over time if we are dedicated to what it is we want to see. We've got about five minutes. Okay. Um, so we're going a little bit over, guys. If, if you need to leave at one o'clock, you can go ahead and leave. We'll, we'll stay for questions and answers. This is just my, my closing statement. Um, each day, how we eat is building an agricultural world around us. I believe we can build one that is increasingly efficient, nourishing, culturally rich with stories and joy, and one that's honest. It will require a regulatory environment which is suitable to small business. It will require technology to accomplish the practical needs of small scale. But most of all, it's going to require customers who want something ideal, that want something lovely, that want something their children will want to write about. Ambition towards an ideal can change laws, direct technology, and make marketing honest, but it requires an ideal, an agreement upon what value is. Questions? Yes, sir. Please go. I have three questions real quick. How many people, how many people does your farm employ? What are the hours that your restaurant is open? <laughs> yeah, so the questions are, how many people do we employ? What hours are we open for dining at the restaurant, which is my wife's side. I spend my time in the goat barn. Is there any place in Wichita where we can buy your product? Yes, 
uh, and is there any place in Wichita we can buy product? Um, we employ on the agricultural side three full-time equivalents. Um, the restaurant side blooms and decreases based on seasonality. A lot of part-time people. The restaurant uh, exists with about six full-time people, but it blooms part-time to about 30 during the summer, most part-time. Um, the restaurant is open on Friday and Saturday by reservation only, and through the spring and summer, we will have alfresco dining on the patio on Saturdays uh, starting in uh, March 23rd, and then we will have summer hours. You can check for those end of May. We will also have uh, some patio dining available Thursday nights. And then Wichita, if you're in Bradley Fair, we have a, a marketing outlet there called Everyday, where you can pick up cheese. Um, that's a, an opportunity in Wichita. Okay, we have another question? Yes. Oh, I have so many questions. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm sorry I went long. I warned you I would. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Um, <coughs> number one, how can we help you with um, supporting you in getting legislation changed? to have the uh, antibiotics sure. screen more thorough, number one. Yeah. You can say that okay. verbally or, you know, give me connections. Um, I would say there's a clear path to that, and it will mostly just require that we have the time. I don't anticipate the Secretary of Dairy taking on something like that, because he's not real interested, frankly. Um, they will support the change if it is made in the laws by the national, um, but the way it's organized is, is going to require a farmer to, pr to do that. If there's a nonprofit that wants to jump in and help get all the technicalities written and the, the data collected in a form that they'll take it, connect them. I'll, I'll happily get them started. Um, yeah. Okay. The other thing is, I don't know if you're aware of how much land that the Chinese own in the U.S. Is it around 500,000 acres? I have no idea. I know that Bill Gates owns almost as much as the Chinese own. Sure. And do you know how they monitor that land? I don't want to say stop selling land to China. But, yes. Um, I just found out recently that Smithfield uh, is owned by China. Yes. I, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for giving this talk because there needs to be a higher awareness of what we're putting in our mouth. Okay, yeah. we got time for one more question. One more, yeah. one more question. Okay. Uh, do you do branding? Branding? Yes. No, but uh, you're talking about the animal? That? You're talking about branding the animal? Yes. No, we do not, but we dehorn. Uh, so we do. Well, let me say the legislation we passed yesterday that the cost of grading is going from 50 to 100 for an animal plus a $5 filing fee. Okay, we'll get the last question right over here. Run over here. Yeah. Two real quick guys. What is the, is there a, a federal uh, law controlling the equipment making the consumer drive out to the. Uh, the farm that we don't purchase, and what do you think is going to, is there enough uh, critical mass to, in the Midwest, to uh, change to where you have lobbying effort and you can change and, and make the field a little bit more fair for small producers? Okay, um, there, the law is state as far as raw milk goes, uh, about states that want to have raw milk legal in supermarkets can do that but they have to basically challenge a federal law um, to do so, which requires a lot of chutzpah. Um, and then the uh, second part, as far as uh, you're asking about, will this, will it change? Um, I, I would say that the, the reason that I spent more time on the value to customer than I did on the regulatory um, is that small farms won't exist if the customer doesn't drive them. The regulatory part is, is critical, 
But the regulatory part is probably tertiary as far as our needs in the current culture that we exist in. Uh, the primary is that customers assign value, not just sentimental um, like to small farms and buy from them. Uh, and the second is that big time marketing technologies that allow small farms to capture share of retail price um, are critical if small farms are going to exist. Okay, sorry we're running out of time today, but George yep. will stick around. Yeah. You can talk to him. And also, we also have a.